Let's listen to a little more here. Mark Shapiro, February 14, 2022, lecture of the Rise of Reform, the Rabbinic Response, lecture number three. So Haskalah was the Jewish Enlightenment, it really got launched in the 19th century as Jews started embracing secular learning. And then of course, if you didn't do that, you have to write Rosh Berlin. What could be worse than a Moscow, a rabbi who's writing... So Shaul Berlin was an Orthodox rabbi and someone with secular learning and also a massive forger. Really a Moscow, uh, publishing a book with all sorts of phony heterim and chuvo to try to undermine tradition. So a heter and heterim refers to permissions. So a rabbi gives you permission, say, to listen to music during a period of the Jewish calendar where normally listening to music is prohibited, but in your case it's permitted because you're struggling with depression. And a chuvot is a rabbinic response to a question. It could be a question about Jewish law, Jewish theology, Jewish philosophy, about life, politics. By attributing to the great figures like the Rush halacha decisions, and people start relying on these halacha decisions. So, so that's pretty bad. Uh, but he didn't know how to deal with Shaul Berlin uh, because here you deal with someone who was uh, one of the big rabbis. It's, it's not it's not your normal thing to have a great rabbi who then goes to the dark side if you want to use uh, the Star Wars terminology. Well, it's as normal as well, any other profession. Like I told him as follows. I, I think it's fascinating. He says, do not write anything. He says, write all of that, how bad the Haskalah was. Yes, but don't write anything about Rochelle Berlin. Now, why not write about Rochelle Berlin? He said, I mean, he, he's a classic example, uh, you could say, of an Abikoris. Heretic. He's, he's one who knows the truth and then just goes off and rejects it all. Uh, listen to what the Cypher says. He says, first, because of the honor due his forefathers, his father, his, his uncles, going back uh, generations, this was four of his great grandparents, these are all Godoli Israel. Great rabbis. And it's a busha, it's an embarrassment to the family to know that such a person came out of them. So that's the first reason he says not to write about it. The second uh, reason is, uh, I mean, this is on the, this, this sort of assumes uh, that uh, um, if you if you deal with someone like Charles Berlin, that somehow the honor of his forefathers is reduced. I don't see it that way. Uh, I think we should be sophisticated enough to know that, uh, uh, look at Aaron, the great Aaron. <laughs> Some of his children didn't turn out so well, and uh, we can give other examples uh, also. Uh, I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't succeeded by his children. I mean, we have, uh, we all heard about Esau, we heard about Yishmael. Well, maybe we should take Ishmael back because Ishmael uh, traditionally is thought to be also a Baal Chufa. And that's why you have an admission of Ishmael. You even have uh, one of the great, the last great important halachic sage in Italy, and the guys in the first part of the 9th century, Rabbi Ishmael HaKohen of Modena. Today you can never name a kid Ishmael because the Arab Israeli dispute calls him a kid Ishmael. But Ishmael is a kosher name. I'm a Rabbi Ishmael. You got it right there. You can't argue with explicit, you know, Talmudic statements. Uh, uh, I'm a we say it all the time, so, uh, uh, the second reason the Cypher says not to write about him is that, uh, perhaps Shaul Berlin has already received his own ish in heaven. He's already received his punishment and he's now cleansed, so therefore you're going to bring it up, uh, that causes more problems. This, I have to say, the Mechilat... So, unless you've experienced Orthodox Judaism, or unless you've experienced... Uh, incredibly intense in-group identity, you don't know how great the pressure is to conform, right? So intense in-group identity is wonderful, it's a source of strength and power, it's an effective tool at navigating life, it tends to make people happier, more effective, but it comes with tremendous disciplines and prices. 
such as restriction of personal freedom. You can't just do what you think is right. Black photo to the state board. This I don't understand at all. Because you can say that then about any sinner. That you can't speak. You can, we're not going to be able to speak about Geiger or, or Jacobson or any of the other people we're going to speak about. I, and so Abraham Geiger and Jacobson were talking about the early reform rabbis in Germany in the 19th century. What would say to me that there's a difference. Those people were heretics from day one, so well, they're just bad. But here you have someone who was a Talmud Chacham and presumably a Tzadik. He becomes a heretic, so we assume that uh, he went back to his uh, Gears of the so went back to his roots. But I have to say, I've never heard of such a thing like that. Uh, that uh, uh, we, we all know about people who became heretics, and I've never heard it. You're not supposed to talk about them on the country. If you look at the Rambam and elsewhere, on the country, you're supposed to speak about them because that's to expose that, but that's what uh, I think that's, I think uh, support for that is in the Talmudic tractate of Yona 59b. Although, as I say this, I think uh, the subtext of the site words, everything he's saying is that the Talmud know all about this, and they know who the Shalbarman was, so they don't need to work. So, Orthodox life is, is segregated, right? There are those in the know. And there are the leading intellectuals, leading thinkers, right? And then there's the, you know, the common people who are just uh, you know, fully occupied with earning a living and being with their friends and family. So not everyone is a, is a scholar in Orthodox Jewish life. About, we don't need to worry about them using Basami Roche. The issue here is only for the masses. Do we need to let the masses? I mean, Joe Shmo and B'nai Brock, does he really need to know about this? That, that's the issue. And again, I would take issue with the sniper because I don't think all the Polsky know about this. There's plenty of Polsky who don't know this story, and it could illuminate it for them. Now, the last two reasons the sniper gives, I think, are the most interesting and the most important uh, as well. He writes that discussing... You're going to write a book on the Hasmala discussing the episode of Shaul Berlin will be humiliating for those sages who were taken in by the fortune. And uh, there have been sages who were taken in. I think the sniper assumes that in the early, there's actually more today who were taken in. In, in Shaul Berlin's day, other than his father, I don't really know of anyone who was taken in. But as you get to more modern times, you have plenty who were taken in. So maybe that's what he was referring to. And he says, if you do this, It'll be embarrassing to those sages who uh, were taken in by the forgery. It will reflect um, poorly on them. Again, I have to say, I, that, that means that we can't discuss the, um, the Yerushalmi Kutchin. In a couple of weeks, we're going to speak to Rabar Hoberlander from Budapest. He's the world's expert on the Yerushalmi Kutchin. You know how many Gedolis Shor were taken in by the Yerushalmi Kutchin? Many more than were taken in by Shal Berlin. The Yerushalmi Kutchin, in the early times, it's published. I can show you, I have a copy of it. So there was a Jew, I think, in the 18th century, Shabtai V, at the height of his fame, fame, about a third of the Jews in the world believed that he was the Messiah, including many leading rabbis. And then Shabtai V ends up converting to Islam. <laughs> Pushed by the Hagos of the Marsham, the great Marsham, the Jose Dachron, they called him, uh, and uh, also uh, Rishola Buber. Great academic scholar, and many good. Chavit Slime was taken in. Chavit Slime starts wearing to film Rabbeinu Tam because of uh, the Yerushalmi Kutchin. But then he gives, and the final reason this labor gives is that, and this I find fascinating, the faith of the simple people, certain people, we should be simple people, will be weakened if they see that a great Torah scholar could be a heretic. Um, and he concludes. By saying that an article... So the chief rabbi of Rome, I think, after World War II, ended up converting to Christianity. Uh, not many great rabbis have converted to Christianity. You can write all about the terrible results of the Spella, but don't mention anything about Shaul Berlin and Torah scholars who were led astray. I think the last reason is, is interesting because, uh, look, for the simple people, not the people on Torah Moshe, simple people who uh, are listening to other talks, uh, they just assume that the more Torah you learn, the greater Tzadik you become, the greater Tzadikim, and that's, uh, everything's great. And that's not true. Uh, just because you learn more Torah doesn't mean you're going to be a better person, a better husband, a better friend, 
better member of the community, doesn't mean you're going to be more honest, doesn't mean you're going to be less addicted to pornography or to alcohol or to drugs. Right? You learn more Torah or you learn more mathematics or you learn more physics, just means that you're more learned in those particular areas. There's no inherent necessary accompaniment to this learning. And just learning about the Holocaust, it doesn't, doesn't make you a better person, doesn't make you kinder, doesn't make you braver, doesn't make you more clear. If you actually expose them to someone who grew up in a rabbinic family, who was uh, a post-seg and a rav, and uh, a future godly decides and lo and behold, he goes off to the dark side, that, they won't be able to handle it. Now, anyone who's sophisticated has heard of Acher. You know, Elisha ben Abuya. You've heard of other people in those circumstances. You're... So Elisha ben Abuya was a heretic in the Talmud, right? He he was friends with Rabbi Meir in in the Talmud, and he may have known uh, Rabbi Akiva as well. But uh, he lost his faith due to Jewish suffering at the hands of the Romans, the Bar Kokhba revolt. Abuya Ginsburg, for instance. Uh, but, I mean, the Holy Ginsburg, who knew more than Holy Ginsburg? Uh, but uh, the slide board is saying that, that, you know, for the average... So Louis Ginsburg, a great Torah scholar, but a leader in conservative Judaism, right? He, he broke away from Orthodox Judaism. At least in his community, this is something that, uh, they, that we don't want them to be exposed to this, uh, this information. Incidentally, I almost said Rav Tzadir, or Chaim Trigger, it's a few we spoke of a number of times. But one of the things I discovered on my trip to Israel a few weeks ago, uh, I, went, I discovered lots of this stuff, including color pictures of Yechiak of Weinberg. No one's ever seen it, they've never been out there. I'm going to put them on the blog post, not the next one, one after. And then you'll see these will become the famous uh, pictures. Uh, no one's going to remember that I discovered it. I might put them on there, but that's okay. But I, uh, the reason I'm not showing you them now is because uh, because I learned my lesson. Someone's going to pull it off the video and do what they did with Heschel, remember, and read the, the talus with the different colors and uh, put it out there. So everyone, and they took the Lieberman pictures I showed you, and they were going all over the internet. Uh, and so uh, someone sent them to me and said, have you seen these pictures? I said, have you seen these pictures? I'm the one who put the pictures out there, uh, and thanks to one of our uh, listeners. And then I told the whole story on a blog post. But um, I discovered a with the ethical will. Yeah, people want people want the covered. Right? People people want the glory. People want the attribution. Right? Even if you're a great scholar, you still want the glory. That's just part of human nature. Chernovitz, believe it or not, Rav Zahir, when he was still in Berlin, but even then he had left Odessa, and everyone assumed already he had uh, he was no longer uh, among the, uh, the, the pious ones, and it's such a religious document to his family. He's going in for an operation, and he says to them, I might not come out of this operation, so I want you to remember, you know, always to be uh, proud of your Judaism, and uh, be aware that the most important thing is not material pursuits, but spiritual pursuits, and keep Eretz Yisrael close to you. He was a big Zioni. Uh, so what a what an ethical will. Uh, and there's a whole genre of ethical wills. I'm not going to reveal where I discovered this, because I don't want to get all these people are going to go and uh, take it out from under me. But uh, it, it's a great, great document. People are going to love this document when I publish this, because uh, it shows you the piety. Of Rav Sayer. Now, some cynic is going to say, well, what do you expect? He's going under the knife. He's having an operation. So now he's uh, he's focused on these things. Okay, it could be. But, uh, you know, Shlomo Pinnis, in uh, Zev Harvey's uh, memoir of Shlomo's uh, eulogy article, on Shlomo Pinnis, the translator of Moray Nevukim, uh, and he was a complete atheist, uh, but a great scholar. He tell- so the Moray Nevukim is Maimonides' work on... Uh, Jewish philosophy. Tells how uh, even in the hospital at these last days when the nurse was there in the Jerusalem hospital and uh, would have just made some comment, I guess, and she said, even now, like even when you're on death's door, you know, this is your attitude. So the nurses apparently were very impressed by my father's behavior and his attitude in his final days. My father went into hospice with about you know, two, two or three weeks left to live. 
obviously he was very weak. Uh, my father and I, we, we made our peace, you know, exchanging emails. And he was about, to, oh, he was about to turn 90. So he did turn 90 before he died. But uh, according to the stories I heard, you know, his pure spiritual, holy self shone through all the, the pain and the suffering. And it was very you know, easy to deal with. He had a positive mental attitude. He knew that he was dying. So get so we're getting back to the, the Sami Rosh. There are these Moshe Kapo and another person, they do they put these books on uh, the computer and they do all these tests and they can show uh if it's one author, multi authors, when it was written. They haven't yet done the Sami Rosh, but when they do the Sami Rosh they will find uh, all sorts of problems. In my article on suicide in the world to come, I point out that uh, this concept that if you commit suicide, you have no share in the world to come, is not found in any of the Rishon. It's, it's a much later idea. Well, not found in any of the Halakha Rishon. It's an uh, Islamic idea. So you have like, a philosophical text that has it. But the Islamic approach knows this. So I see that as a proof, an eternal proof. Also, you see the Islamic approach. So you can see these breaks in the rocks here. Now this is all going to fall away. One day, I just hope it's not a day that I'm standing on top. Uh, the, the ocean's just going to keep pounding away, and the rocks are going to keep caving and cracking and falling down to the ocean. Let me not be here. So this looks like we're on the moon, doesn't it? Aside from the whole ocean thing. It's possible that the rush or any visual for that matter could have, uh, could have said these things. Uh, and this is what, uh, what uh, the Mordechai ben Nat and Achas and Sofer and so many others uh, went crazy about. Now what I'm going to try to show in my article uh, is that uh, I found all sorts of little tidbits uh, scattered. Uh, you know, the foragers always like to leave little things. I think I've identified some tidbits as well. But um, before looking at some of the Chuvot, which I believe, perhaps I believe, but are reformist Chuvot, I think it's not only, and this is important, it's not only the conclusions of 